In 2023, Stanford's acceptance rate was 1.4%. UCLA's was a 1.8%. And this video is all about helping you become that 1% who gets into these top schools. We'll start from the absolute beginning, freshman year, and give you the exact blueprint on how to build a competitive application. This happens in three phases. We call this the PEA or P framework, planning, execution, and assessment. I'm Mike. I've helped hundreds of pre-meds get into their dream medical schools over the last seven years. Schools like UCLA and UCSF. Phase number one is knowing what it takes to get into a top medical school. Phase number two is knowing what to do to build that application. And phase number three is knowing when to do it. When do all those puzzle pieces fit on the actual timeline? Phase number one, there are two easy ways to know what it takes to get into a top medical school. The first way is to watch application breakdowns. For example, here is an application breakdown of my own application that got into UCLA. And here is another application breakdown of one of our mentors here at Pre-Med Catalyst who got into UCSF. Or if you don't want to watch these application breakdowns, you can read full applications with complete personal statements and complete extracurricular activities. If you want to do that, our application database linked in the description box below has eight full medical school applications that got into schools like UCSF, UCLA, UC San Diego, USC. Everything is there for you to see what medical schools cared about, what stood out for these accepted now medical students. After knowing what it takes, you'll need to know what to do to build an application that meets acceptance criteria. Here, you'll want to take what you've seen in the application breakdowns or on the application database and reverse engineer what made those applications special. Or you can watch all the interviews that the AAMC puts out of real admissions officers telling you exactly what they're looking for when they read applications. Here's a YouTube video where I've compiled many admissions committee officers and summarize what they care about most. All of these resources at Pre-Med Catalyst boil down to a simple six lever framework. These are the only six levers that you can pull on to adjust or affect your medical school admissions odds. Lever one is your GPA. Lever two is your MCAT. Lever three are your extracurricular activities. These include your research, clinical experience, volunteering, and the sort. Lever four is your letters of recommendations. Five, your school list. And six, your written application and your interviews. For freshmen, you really only have to worry about the first four. You can worry about the school list and the written application a later down the line. This framework is so powerful because it helps you make any decision in your pre-med journey. So long as you tie it back to how it affects your GPA, how it affects your MCAT, how it affects your extracurricular activities, or how it affects your letters of recommendation, you can make pretty much any decision for your pre-med journey. For example, if you're wondering if you should take that part-time EMT job on the nights and the weekends, think about how does it affect my GPA? How does it affect my extracurricular activities? Does the additional say 100, 150 hours of being an EMT, is that worth the drop I'm going to see in my GPA because I'm not sleeping well? because I have less time to study? For most students, likely not. But for a student whose entire application is built around acute care, emergency medicine, working with underserved communities, that activity may do a ton for their application. At Prevent Catalyst, we make every single decision rooted in the six lever framework, and we encourage you to do the same if it's helpful. Phase three, after you know what it takes and you know what to do, you must know when to do it. And truthfully, the four-year plan to medical school is not rocket science. There's not a lot of moving parts, especially if you want to go on a no gap year timeline. Really, you're applying at the end of your junior year, so there's not really a lot of runway or time to accomplish what you need. And in fact, to make things very easy for you, I've made two extremely detailed videos here and here on how to create your four-year plan, whether you want a zero, one, or two gap year situations. Pair those two videos with the four-year plan template we have linked in the description box below, and you'll have a four-year plan in literally less than 20 minutes. The main concept here is to work backwards from your goal. If you want to take no gap year, then your application must be ready by spring quarter of junior year. 
And that means your MCAT should fall into the summer leading into junior year, which means all your prerequisites must be done by the spring of your sophomore year. So just move around the puzzle pieces, bio, biochem, gen chem, o chem, physics, There's not a lot of room for those classes to slot into. This makes the major milestones when you're going to apply, when you're going to take your MCAT, and when you are taking your prereqs very, very clear. And of course, there are many nuances and some advanced tactics, both of which are covered in those two four-year plan videos. And I encourage you to watch those to finalize your plan. All right, phase two of the PEA framework is execute. By now, you know what it takes, what to do, and when to do it. Now, we need to figure out how to do it well. We can go down the line for each of the six levers and talk about how to optimize each lever. For example, for lever one, to protect your GPA, you really only need to follow a few guidelines. Defer harder classes because harder classes have a higher risk of not getting an A. In addition, push classes that you don't need, bio lab, gen chem lab, o chem lab, general education classes, until after you apply to medical school. They are also areas where you cannot get an A. Another principle is when the option exists to take an easier professor, then do that. There's no honor in taking the exact same class that gives you the exact same credits, but just doing it with a professor who only gives 7% A's as opposed to the other professor who gives 25% A's. Choose your major carefully. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be a bioengineer or a computer scientist, but recognize that those majors are far harder to earn a 4.0 in. And even if you can earn a 4.0, it'll just mean that you'll have to work harder and study longer than your peers who are molecular biology or physiological science major. Again, that does not mean you should never be a computer science major, or an English literature major, or a bioengineer. It means that you have to weigh the pros and cons of being in that major, having that skill set, which has a ton of pros in medicine to help you stand out. Weigh those pros with the cons of the hit you will take to your GPA. And the last guideline here is to remember that your GPA is something that can be changed you can get better at studying. Not only can you study harder, you can study more effectively. And there are many well-documented evidence-based practices to help you learn how to learn better. Active learning, space repetition, the Feynman method. When I was a freshman, I watched one single three hour long Skillshare course by Ali Abdal on how to study effectively. That course is free today on YouTube and still is the most valuable video I've ever watched because those study tactics have carried me through the MCAT, through my medical board, step one, step two, and every shelf exam in between. Take the time to learn how to study effectively and efficiently. It is going to be the most exponential skill that you have as a professional student for the next 11 years. All right, so let's now talk about how to execute on lever number two, the MCAT. By far the number one mistake that pre-meds make during the MCAT is not optimizing a full-time eight to 12 week study schedule to protect time for this monster of an exam. Too many pre-meds do not have the foresight to plan for the MCAT during a summer. And so they end up taking it January or March months before they need to apply to medical school. Now, while this can work out, it is not optimal. And what inevitably happens is that you don't study as much as you'd like because you're busy taking your major courses during your junior or senior year, and you're busy doing your research lab in the morning and clubs in the evening, and you're busy recovering from a tiring week on the weekend, you don't prepare well for this exam. What that leads to is pushing the exam back a month and two months and soon, when you feel forced and cornered to take the exam, that pressure gets you, that lack of preparation gets to you, and people end up having to retake the exam or worse yet, push it off to a next year and be forced to take a gap year because their MCAT score just wasn't there. The number one highest yield guideline to optimize lever to the MCAT is to make sure that you protect eight to 12 weeks of full time. That means 40 to 60 plus hours a week, full time studying just to this large standardized exam. If that means you have to push up your biochemistry prereq and have a couple of difficult quarters, then so be it. You need that summer protected. If that means you can't fit everything in and you need to take an extra year, do that proactively instead of reactively when your poor MCAT score 
forces you to take another year off. Do not handicap yourself. This exam is very difficult. Lastly, let's get tactical with lever three, your extracurricular activities. Based on the adcom interviews and the studying you've done from real applications in our application database or watching our application breakdown series, you'll know that the goal is to create a cohesive thematic narrative in your application. And just like our four-year plan, we can work backwards with the end in mind. If we have a sense of what our resume wants to look and feel like, we can find extracurricular activities that fill those holes. At Pre-Med Catalyst, we do exercises with our students, things like the favorite topics, one-liner, and three pillars exercises that help us get a sense of the essence or the important things in our students' lives. Essentially, what we're trying to get at is what medical schools will know and remember you for, what pre-med archetypes you fall into, and how you will stand out thematically. Coming up on the screen here is an example from one of our students' one-liner and favorite topics exercise. You can see how his application is beginning to get centered around neuroscience and teaching and mentorship. And even after all the stuff that we talked about in this video, you're still not sure how strong or how competitive your application is. That's what we created the Pre-Med Catalyst Mentorship Program for. If you found this video helpful, you will absolutely find our mentorship program helpful. We help you find a theme build that application intentionally, and we're always there in your corner to be your support system through all of the decisions you have to make. And if you want some more inspiration on what the different pre-med archetypes are, I made this video explaining all the standout exceptional archetypes like the community health archetype or the physician scientist archetype, all the way down to the most mediocre ones. And here is an example of our three pillars exercise where we're trying to find core themes that we want to highlight our application. These pillars can stand on their own, but we found pretty interesting extracurriculars happen when you try and overlap the three pillars. For example, some of my core pillars were basketball and teaching and mentorship. And when you combine teaching and mentorship and basketball, you find at the intersection coaching youth basketball or mentoring youth players and that's exactly one of my extracurriculars. In fact, one of my favorite ones that many medical schools had talked about. And lastly, to optimize extracurriculars, remember that there are rules of admission to your dream medical schools. Easiest way to know exactly what Stanford or UCSF wants in their medical school class is to look at the secondary prompts that they are asking applicants explicitly every single year. For example, here's Stanford universities, and I want you to focus on questions three and five through eight. So it's clear that Stanford is looking to build a diverse class of future physician leaders. People who work in academia, private practice, physician scientists, people interested in health policy, health administration, underserved communities. And not only are they going to ask what you're interested in, they're going to want to see proof that you have already established yourself as an impact maker, a difference maker, a leader in this space. And you'll see in the lower questions, they wanna get a sense of your identity, of the communities that you are a part of. And so if you're passionate about serving LGBTQ plus populations, and that's gonna be in your one-liner, and that's gonna be a core pillar of your three pillars, your extracurricular activities must support and must provide strong evidence that you are already a leader in this community. This way, Stanford knows exactly who they're getting and they know the person that they're getting has already a proven track record. Once you have built a strong foundation of an application, you have all your bases covered, that is when you can transition to chasing impact, chasing depth over everything. Find the extracurriculars where you are special, where only you can make the difference, and double, triple, quadruple your time and energy investment there. You can't just exist passively in an extracurricular. You have to act actively, intentionally, driving the goals of the organization forward. One framework that our students here at Pre-Med Catalyst have found very helpful is the more, better, new framework. Can you figure out how to put on more health fairs if your club is only putting on one a quarter? Can you figure out what organizations you need to partner with to streamline patient flow during the hectic start of a health fair? And once you've exhausted all the more options and all the better options, then you can consider new things like what new services can we add to our health fair? Oftentimes, most people jump to the new when the easiest and most impactful thing is how do we just do more 
of what is working. You want to repeat this cycle of more, better, and new every single quarter to increase your impact quarter over quarter. The re and the final phase of the PEA framework is the A or assessment. No one can possibly create the exact four-year plan template day by day, quarter by quarter, that outlines exactly what you'll do from freshman year to medical school application. Undoubtedly, things will change. Your interests will evolve. You won't be able to get into a certain class. You'll find a surprise opportunity that was absolutely perfect for you. So equally as important as phase one, preparation, or phase two, executing, is phase three, taking a step back and assessing where you are. Compare your application with applications you know have gotten into your dream medical school, schools like UCSF and UCLA, and answer the question, are you on track to have the same level and caliber of application? If the answer is no, you'll have to change trajectory. Every quarter, revisit your four-year plan, ask yourself a difficult question, and make sure you're hitting your goals. Hope this video helped. PEA, planning, execute, assess. Thank you for watching. See you next time.